go ahead. Well, thank you, Kellen, and thank you to Vivid Vision. What a great, great opportunity over these last several weeks of wonderful speakers and topics. And the best is seeing people literally from all over the world attending these lectures. So we're very honored to be here with you. Um, I'm Dr. Lynn Hellerstein, and I practice outside of Denver, Colorado, just a suburb of Denver. And Taylor Benton is vision therapist, sports vision trainer at our office. And it's just uh, exciting that we get to talk to you today about enhancing your sports performance, testing and training. Next slide. I do have disclosure of conflict. Uh, I actually own a uh, separate company called Hellerstein Resources for Creative Learning. Uh, it's also the publishing company of many of the books and DVDs and, and uh, other kinds of products that are uh, vision related. Next. So the big question, what do all of these athletes have in common? And you see that all different sports from football to baseball to tennis, volleyball, soccer, you know, all of these people or athletes, what do they have in common? Well, basically, according to Bill Bowerman, who's co-founder of Nike, Nike Shoes, if you have a body, you are an athlete, which is a very inclusive definition of who is an athlete pretty much anybody. So tonight's topic really is about what is sports vision? You will see a little bias of Colorado teams like the Avalanche, the Rockies, and the Denver Broncos, and we're gonna cover all sports. We'll try not to be too biased. So we'll start with a basic definition of sports vision. It's the evaluation, treatment, management care and consultation designed to protect, correct, and enhance the vision for athletes of all ages. Also, we want to make sports and athletic competition safer and more successful. So it is just not about the enhancement, but truly I'm sure you've seen many young and older athletes that are playing sports that don't have appropriate uh, uh, glasses protections. And so we're looking at making sports safer and that athlete being more successful. So here's a few tenets of, of sports vision that, you know, there's been some other really great speakers that I've heard uh, on vivid vision and we agree on a many, many concepts. And here's some of the key points. Vision is our dominant sense. And if you look at neurology of the brain, you'll find more place in the brain that lights up with visual sensory motor kinds of processing. You know, it's always interesting when you hear athletes or coaches talk and they'll often say hand-eye coordination. And truly, we're looking at the eyes lead the body. Eye-hand coordination, eye-foot coordination. Vision is a key skill in most sports. You know, if you're a wrestler, you have peripheral vision, but it's much more tactile and body sensing. If you're a baseball player, hockey, tennis, you know, those are the sports where the fast moving balls, um, the faster and the smaller the object, more likely vision is more of a priority and a key skill in that sport. But I understand that visual demands vary by sport to sport. And we all have unique visual systems. And many of us who are more peripherally aware may be better at a sport like soccer and, and uh, basketball, whereas other sports that uh, really demand very sharp uh, central vision, you might be a better shooter. So again, we all have unique systems and our demands vary by each sport. So why are we interested in sports? And it's just not sports, but it, we can also talk about the arts and music and other, but performance and vision. It's integral to primary eye care. You might just say, oh no, I just have a routine uh, insurance uh, practice, but I'll tell you what, most of those people are involved in some type of sports or other type of performance activity besides just needing glasses or ocular health services. 
if you practice sports performance and uh, vision training, it adds a lot of value to your services. It'll actually even increase your patient base. Parent might bring in their little kiddo for concerns with school and learning issues. You start talking a little bit about sports, all of a sudden that, that parent might be interested in what you're doing to help their tennis game or their golf game. Uh, it'll encourage patients to more regularly utilize your services and just see you more than just a routine lens cranker. You know, you have a lot of other skills that you can help your patient base here. And one thing we already know for sure, if optometry doesn't address the athlete's vision needs, patients go somewhere else. And sometimes now we're seeing these patients go to trainers, therapists, people who just try to start working on vision. And if they don't realize that optometry, optometry is really, you're gonna see, this is our field. You know, lenses and prisms. A lot of people can teach tracking, but boy, optometry is the leader in sports vision. And if you don't let your patients know, and they see a little ad just about somebody in sports vision, patients will go somewhere else. So, you know, these are some of the basic questions we'll ask athletes. Can you confidently see, track, focus, and concentrate to excel at your sport? And most athletes go, oh yeah, you know, as they're swinging and missing the ball. So they may or may not realize that most athletes will not necessarily tell you that they're having a problem because they don't like that they think they're having a problem. Some will, some will go, man, I lose the ball. I can't just follow it well. But a lot of them really think that they see, track, focus, and concentrate. We want to know from that athlete, do you ever feel disconnected from what you see and how your body responds? And you're going to see a lot of case examples throughout our presentation, how you know, many athletes feel they're right on, they're standing, they're looking, and the ball's not there, or they miss kick or something. And there's a disconnect between what that athlete sees and how the body responds. So I'm going to turn it over to Taylor and he's going to go on from here. Cool. Thank you, Dr. Hellerstein. Can everyone hear me okay? Good. Cool. So I just wanted to thank iHeartVT and Vivid Vision for putting all of this together. Um, there's been some really amazing speakers. I also really quickly wanted to say congratulations to all of our new fellows, uh, our new COVTs, especially uh, Kristen, who I mentored and I have some friends. <laughs> Um, in Idaho, so I'm really proud of you guys. Um, Mom, if you're watching, I finally accomplished something like you never said that I would. Just kidding. So uh, anyway, so back to sports vision. So who can benefit from sports vision training is really on how you view sports vision. Like Dr. Hellerstein said, if you have a body, you are an athlete. And down here, you know, we've listed a few of the demographics that we work with but as we get further along in the PowerPoint, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how sports vision can be impactful for everybody and how it might work for those that you don't necessarily think of first and foremost for sports. Um, I've worked with um, a few of the first responders, obviously military personnel have really high demands physically, and you have to think of sports vision as the eyes leading the body, meaning that if your vision isn't optimized and where you want it to be, then all of those other areas of physicality and ability and speed and strength kind of falls to the wayside. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go further. So is there a need for sports vision? Absolutely. These are some statistics on the right. 90 million Americans participate in sports. Um, avidly, and then another 84 million participate in a sport occasionally. So, you know, when we talk about sports, especially in a state like Colorado, everyone is really active. We have a lot of great outdoors. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about how sports vision is really amazing as a motivational tool for your current patients. Um, that's really how I recommend for a lot of the therapists to start to kind of break into sports vision. I think using sports as a way to connect with some of your patients and use it as a motivational tool is going to get you to start to see sports vision a little bit 
differently. One of the things that I like to do when I have my patients get in for the first time, um, typically with like a reading and learning phase, a young kiddo, we'll sit down, we'll talk a little bit about why they're here, what vision is, what they have, what they want to work on. Um, and then I'll ask them, you know, do you play any sports? What do you like to do for fun? What do you like to do outside? And they'll tell me, oh, I play soccer, I play baseball, I play basketball. And I say, oh, that's great. You know, what do your eyes have to do with playing basketball? And they'll say, oh, it helps me see, it helps me shoot. And I say, great. What if we could um, help you get a little bit better at basketball or get a little bit better at soccer? And their eyes will kind of light up because, you know, a lot of our kiddos who struggle with reading and learning think that they're coming here because there's something wrong with them. And when we incorporate sports into what we're doing both uh, in the therapy room and then what they're doing at home for practice, they really start to build a connection with you and find some, some more positivity in an area that for them, they know that they're struggling in and it, it helps us create a great connection with them. So use sports as a motivational tool for a lot of your younger patients. All right. So these are some statistics. Um, Dr. Hellerstein pulled these, and I, I think this is really eye-opening, no pun intended. Um, never assume that a high-level athlete, whether they're a collegiate athlete, professional athlete, has had a full compre comprehensive eye exam or assume that they have optimal visual skills. Um, you know, we see college athletes, high school athletes, or even some professional athletes who you know, have a reduced acuity, they're not handling their contacts correctly, they have reduced stereopsis, and they functioned so well for so long because they're that good at what they do or physically they're that gifted. So don't make any assumptions about even high level athletes that you end up seeing in your practice. Um, I think this is really important because I, I wanna talk a little bit about when I first started to get into sports vision, one of the things that I used to question or say to myself was, you know, yeah, sports vision is cool, but is the investment worth it for them? You know, a lot of athletes will pay money for gyms or trainers or for equipment, and they'll spend a lot of money. And parents will spend a lot of money for kids who are on club teams or traveling teams. And as a therapist or a doctor, you really have to see the benefit of sports vision to be able to convey it to your patients. You have to see what we do as at the top level of improving sports performance. And when you see it personally and understand how important vision is, you're going to be able to convey that to them and you're going to help them understand that, hey, this is something worth investing in because of how impactful it can be to your performance. Um, so just keep that in mind. Keep thinking about how as an individual, as a therapist, doctor, how do you view, view sport vision? If you already have a sports vision practice, obviously you, you view it pretty highly, but if you're kind of starting to move into this realm and you're not sure of where you fit or how you can convey it to parents or, or athletes, just work on that and think about it and try to understand vision's impact and movement and it's gonna take you that much further. All right, so some of the sports vision services, Dr. Hellerstein touched a little bit on this earlier. Um, obviously, vision correction, making sure we've got an optimal prescription for our athletes, whether it's contact lenses, the type of spectacles they're wearing, progressive bifocals. Protective eyewear is really, really important. I'm gonna tell a story a little bit later about one of my patients who uh, got hit in the eye with a softball and she came to us she has a, or had about a 35 constant XT. She had glaucoma and a cataract induced based uh, from the trauma. So protective eyewear is huge. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we recommend for that. And then detecting and treating sports vision symptoms from TBI. I think it was Dr. Andrich who in his presentation, he was working with a baseball player and through some uh, anomalies with uh, the baseball player's eye movement skills, he was able to pinpoint that he had a concussion a few years earlier. And it was from doing some testing visually that he was able to pick, 
pick up on that. And that really had impacted that baseball player throughout his you know, career. So working with patients with TBIs, especially if they got it from playing sports, goes hand in hand with sports vision. We're gonna talk a lot about performance vision training, sports vision therapy, obviously. Um, and then some of the higher level doctors get to work with teams, which is really cool as well, because you're not just training one player, but you're getting everyone on the same level of uh, sports vision. So everyone will have the same mindset on that team of, hey, we need to do our uh, vision activities, we need to do our sports vision warmups, things like that. That's, that's a really cool opportunity that as you kind of dive into this field, you might get the opportunity to work with not only one athlete, but everyone on their team. And then of course, education and awareness. The more that you know as a therapist and as a doctor, and the more that you can educate your, para, uh, your patients, excuse me, uh, that's just gonna create so many more doors. When you have somebody in and they're successful and their game starts to improve, they're gonna tell their friends, they're gonna tell their coaches. So it's really our job to be very knowledgeable about what we do and to educate our athletes on how we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing because they're gonna spread the word. So, all right, uh, vision is our dominant sense. I hope everyone shares the same feeling that I do. Uh, we've seen the statistic um, as a percentage quite often that over 80% of our um, neurological function and sensory input is through the visual system. So I think tying back to what I said earlier that really important to not only see a quote like this, but believe it and understand it. You know, what could our vision be like if we can learn to actively control it as an athlete. One of the things that I like to say in my sports vision consult is I say, hey, you know, what would happen if you lost 50% of your physical strength? And they would say, you know, man, that would, be, that would be terrible. I wouldn't be as good at what I'm doing now. And I say, what if you lost 50% of your vision? And when you think about it kind of like that, the athlete might say, yeah, that would be hugely impactful. So, you know, patients will start to see vision in ways they haven't seen it before. Athletes will start to recognize vision in ways they haven't seen before as you educate them, and as you kind of convey the principles of vision guiding their body and guiding their motor skills. Um, another thing that I, I like to, to discuss is how, as individuals, how um, something such as stress or anxiety can impact our vision. Uh, or at the end of the game, if you're tired or fatigued, you might go tunnel vision. And if you go tunnel vision, you know, when your visual skills are compromised, the rest of your game is gonna be compromised as well. So just a few things to think about. One of our favorite pictures of Dr. Heller's here, Dr. H, did you wanna comment on this picture at all? Taylor, are you sure it's me? You know what, it might not be. It actually might yeah. not be. <laughs> Perfect example of eyes not, well, eyes leading the hand. No idea where I'm looking. You can see where the ball is down below the bat. I'm wondering why I missed. So, you know, just a great example of eyes lead the body or not. Yep. And, you know, this is a, a good example of just like our patients who see us for reading and learning difficulties. You know, if they're struggling in an area and other professionals can't figure out why, it's the same thing for sports vision. If a kiddo is not able to catch a ball or he's not able to hit and no one can really figure out why, it could be a, a unresolved vision problem. So these are some signs of sports vision problem. And I'll leave this up here for a minute or so. Um, a lot of patients who I keep saying patients, patients, athletes go hand in hand. Um, a lot of our athletes who have a sports vision issue, one, they might not even and realize it. And two, it's our job to ask the right questions to help them recognize if there's something going on. So a lot of times something like inconsistent performance, meaning they, they do well one day, they don't do well another day not performing up to uh, one's potential is a huge indicator. 
you know, the athlete has all the tools, all the gifts, physically, they're bright, but for whatever reason, it's not all tied together for them. Um, they practice a lot and it's just not getting better. That could be indicative of a sports vision problem. So it's not just knowing these things, but knowing how to probe and how to ask the right questions so that you can kind of peel back the layers and see if there's more going on than, than what they're kind of leading on. So these are a few specific examples of uh, a sports vision problem. For football, a quarterback who can't find the receivers, you know, they might have a collapsed periphery, but down at the bottom, someone who struggles with concentration drops. That phrase drives me crazy because the, you know, wide receiver's one job when he's running down the field, down the field is to catch the football. I don't think that he's losing cognitive concentration or thinking about something else. Chances are it's a vision problem. And we have to be kind of careful when we're questioning athletes about this because we don't want to put them in a negative mindset or say, you know, what goes wrong when you play? What, you know, what does the coach yell at you about? You want to say something like, what could you improve on? Or what happens that you would like to not have happened as much? So think about the phrasing as well. Very rarely will athletes come in and say, oh, you know, I, I just can't catch a ball or, um, you know, I'm not performing up to my optimal level. Those aren't conversational um, ways of speaking that an athlete will come in and, and just clearly state that sometimes, but, but not very often. So uh, this is, again, to tie back to vision is motor, vision is movement. Almost every movement that we make in sports, whether it's moving your hands, moving your legs, um, it's guided by vision. So we have to think about moving through space as a visually guided action. And when our athletes get that and understand that, they'll start to think about their vision differently. The first point of contact with whatever happens around you typically is vision and even if it's not central vision even if you're not looking at the ball being peripherally aware having good spatial awareness um the the where am i skeffington circles is is vision so knowing how you're interacting with your environment it's not just leading the body as in you know one hand motion it's how your whole body moves um so Think about that, learn how to convey that to your patients and they'll start to see the value in, in, what, in what you do for them. And then this is a really cool concept. Dr. Hellerstein has talked about this quite a few times with me that vision is the athlete's time machine. And this all comes down to timing. Everything in sports is timing. Knowing when to raise your hands to catch the ball, knowing when to swing to hit the ball, or swing the tennis racket, you have to have good timing. And we use the metronome a lot. It's one of the best tools for training timing. But when it comes down to a tenth of a second or half a second of knowing when to do things in sports, you have to be able to visually time what's happening around you and correspond accordingly with your body. So timing is is huge and it might be bigger for some athletes than it is for other athletes sorry just fixing my side over here um oh one more thing that i want to say about timing a lot of times we'll see athletes who are very physically gifted you know they have all the strength they have the agility i'm thinking of one patient that i saw in particular she's um, a great softball player and talking to her and talking to her parents when she hit the ball, she knocked it out of the park, but she wasn't consistent with that. And it was my goal to improve her consistency because just because you can hit it out of the park, if you're not doing that very often, there's an issue there. You know, I want to be able to control her strength and her movements and her ability and get her to hit the ball more consistently because that was really important to her. So keep that in mind that a lot of athletes go at 100% and through timing, we have to kind of rein that in a little bit so that they can control their body and control their movements. Again, 
uh, superior size, strength, and speed do not make up for um, inefficient processing, knowing when to move, knowing where to move. So if there's a visual deficiency, it, it doesn't matter how good you are, how fast you are. Um, if an athlete can't control their body and put it all together, we hear that a lot. Um, the athlete, they, they're just not putting it all together. And I see that as a vision problem because visually guided movements will determine what they're going to do next. And just because you're physically gifted, if you can't control all those physical gifts, you're, you know, you're not going to be working up to that optimal level. So a lot of visual skills needed for sports. I have in parentheses and learning because all of these are important for so many different types of sports. Uh, some of the previous sports vision presentations touched on these. I'm not going to go into them too in depth. Um, I put a couple stars by peripheral vision and depth perception slash depth awareness because I think these skills are really, really important and might even be more important for some sports than others. But just think of sports the same as vision and learning. You know, you need to have optimal functioning of all these different skills. Obviously, visual motor integration, obviously uh, good virgin skills at near, particularly at far. So very similar um, to some, what some of the other doctors have touched on. We talked a little bit about what a sports vision problem is. Uh, a big question is who has potential for sports vision improvement? And I think that almost every athlete does. The really fun types of athletes that we get in the office are the ones who um, need enhancement, meaning their visual skills are adequate, but we want to get them to an optimal level. And those are the ones where you get to load a lot of really tough activities. You get to make things really challenging because I really think everyone has uh, potential for improvement if we think of almost every movement starting in the visual system. Some of the times we have uh, athletes who come in and down at the bottom, you can see they might have the appearance of poor focus, laziness, or having an off day. It's the same thing as a kiddo who has an ADHD diagnosis or struggles with paying attention or has behavioral issues. You know, if visually they're not adequate, then those are some of the things that might show up and be interpreted by the parents or the coach. Just something to, to kind of change your mindset of, of someone who has a sports vision problem. I'm gonna talk about two different gateways for moving into sports vision. Um, if you're a therapist who hasn't done a ton of sports vision, number one, you know, your patients that you're already working with incorporate sports into what they're doing. If you see patients for reading and learning, business, tra traumatic brain injury, it's a great way to start to get comfortable to um, changing some of the procedures that you're already doing, but make them more sports oriented. I love when I get to tell a patient, hey, bring your soccer ball in next week, bring your bat, bring your uh, basketball, and their eyes light up because that's, that's cool to them. They're doing something new and different and unique, but they're still playing sports while they're coming into the office and having fun. So that's one type. And then the second type are the athletes who come to us specifically for sports vision training. Usually they hear about us through a hitting coach, a team coach, teammates. Um, on that second bullet, a lot of times they're not educated on our role in sports. They come to us and they say, you know, hey, I heard about you guys, but I don't really know what to expect. Whereas in the last slide, you know, those patients have come to us because they know that there's a vision problem and that it's something that we can help with. So for the athletes that come to us specifically for sports vision, we have to do a little bit more to build a relationship, build trust, and then to create buy-in because they've heard about us, but they might not know how much we have to offer. All right, so we're gonna touch on each of these. This is just gonna let you know where I am in the sequence of how we do sports vision training at our office. I'm going to talk a little bit about the comprehensive binocular exam, refractive correction, the sports vision evaluation, which I think is crucial. And if you're not doing it, 
you should, and then sports vision training. All right, so for the binocular exam, you, you wanna do things a little bit differently. Uh, I think uh, OEP recommends the 21 point binocular exam. If you have your own binocular workup, you know, all those skills you're gonna need for sports, but you might have to cater it a little bit differently if you're working with an athlete. So if you have something like an MS system, you wanna check stereo at distance. You wanna do your prism bar ranges at distance. You wanna do your phorias, um, your vergence ranges. Try to work all of that at distance. If you have a patient who comes to see you and they have a reading and learning problem, chances are we, we really wanna focus on doing things within arm's length, but I wanna know their binocular skills again, at a distance. That's gonna tell me a lot more. Most sports are happening at a distance, especially ball sports. And then just because an athlete who comes into your office has normal or adequate visual findings, that might not be good enough. Um, I'm thinking about an athlete that I was working with who had mild refractive amblyopia, 2025. His stereo was 30 seconds of arc but that's not good enough because he really wanted to improve and his parents wanted to get better. And if we didn't think about creating superior visual skills, we might've said, eh, but I want him at 20 seconds of arc really quickly. I want good speed of stereo and I want 2020. And so, you know, working with him, the parents and I had a, a lot of conversations regarding, you know, his visual skills are adequate. They're not bad but we're gonna get them better and superior. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about refractive correction. Um, later in the presentation, I'm gonna discuss how uh, optimal clarity is huge for certain sports. If Dr. Sanit's watching, I hope he's not cursing me under his breath because I am gonna talk about acuity and clarity. But for certain sports like baseball, you have to see the, the seam as it's coming out of the pitcher's hand or golf where you have to see, you know, 100 yards away, you, you want to be able to see the blades of grass, things like that. You have to have um, optimal clarity. Uh, on the next slide, I'm going to let Dr. Hellerstein talk a little bit about the timing of a first prescription related to sports. But think about prescribing for specific distances. And what I mean by that is, and this is really in regards to your presbyopic patients, but if you have you know, an, an, uh, a presbyopic patient who is playing golf, think about what type of lens they're in. Are they in a progressive? Are they in a bifocal, a trifocal? Or you have um, someone who plays like pickleball or tennis, are they looking at a scorecard? Are they looking up close? Think about you know, prescribing a specific sports uh, prescription. Do you want to just do single vision? If you have a patient that ha has a really high script, you should be trying to get them into contact lenses to reduce the peripheral distortion. I know everyone loves prescribing progressives, but um, the peripheral swim is a real pain. And if we're trying to play sports, we don't want that. Going back to a traditional line bifocal might be the best option. And then uh, refractive surgery, that's another, you know, a little bit more of a dramatic jump, but you might say, hey, you could be struggling with seeing the best you could be or using your peripheral vision because you have such thick lenses. And this is really the time to create buy-in from the athlete. If you're a doc who's writing a prescription based specifically for sports, they may have never had that before. Or you're talking about different options in terms of contact lenses or a traditional bifocal. Um, Oakley makes a progressive lens designed specifically for golf. It's got a, a, a larger intermediate um, corridor and less of a, of a near focus corridor because it doesn't, you don't need to look up close except to look at your look at your scorecard so these are some things just to think about when you're when you're prescribing and then interchangeable lenses is is another really cool option that some frame manufacturers are starting to make um, you can change out your lenses depending on the time of day if you're a, a cyclist or a runner or skiing so 
just things to think about and kind of to become aware of. So Dr. H, I'll let you talk a little bit about timing of that first prescription. Yeah, it's really critical. Uh, many times we'll think uh, an athlete might benefit from a refractive prescription or prism or whatever, but you don't always want to do it right in the middle of their season. I remember when I first started in sports vision, I had a basketball player come in. He was minus four OU, never wore glasses or contacts, was really a pretty good basketball player. And think about basketball, a lot of periphery awareness, but you'd always see him with this little squint, you know, when he'd look to shoot from a pretty far distance. So I thought, oh man, I'm really gonna help you out and gave him soft contact lenses. Couldn't believe how well he could see, plays his first game and he undershot the basket by a foot, almost every single shot. And he was really furious, like, well, I'm not gonna wear these if. And it was really just, he had a really, um, practice and relearn space through the lenses. So the timing is critical if they're in the middle of a season, uh, depending if they're struggling, what their symptoms are, where they're at, you may or may not want to make a change to their lens until they're in the off season. Prescribing for athletes is really different than the way that we normally prescribe for most of our patients in a behavioral manner. I mean, rarely, rarely, rarely do I give people who measure minus 25 a prescription. But if you have a baseball player try, or a tennis player trying to hit a hundred mile an hour plus fastball and it's dusk time, sometimes those little quarters of diopters or sills that you normally wouldn't want to give, they sometimes make a difference. Same thing with hyperopia. We'll, um, Often not, they may need a, a hyperopic prescription, let's say for reading it near. And we often will not give it, that person anything at distance. However, I will tell you, for example, patients who've had concussions and then they'll come and see us and a very low plus, even at distance sometimes makes a huge difference in performance. So again, we're very, very sensitive to the athlete's needs and the value we get out of a lens, and it may be really, uh, you know, our belief system sometimes has to shift a little bit to the needs of the acuity and sharpness and focus and all these things of an athlete. And it might be a little different than what we routinely do with most of our patients. And if and we can get away with contact lenses to reduce anisos and, and uh, open periphery, we like that, but then you have to weigh that, especially in places like Colorado that's very dry and a higher altitude. And then I remember I screened a whole team of baseball players at a local college and they were all wearing, almost all of them wearing soft contact lenses. Their acuities were about 20, 25, 20, 30. Uh, contrast sensitivity was greatly reduced. And it's like, what is going on here? All these athletes have contacts and they weren't cleaning them well. They were dirty. They were really dry. So as much as we love to use contacts, if it if it's available, sometimes the conditions warrant that it may not always be the best for that athlete. And Dr. Andrich talked a little bit about even prescribing a minus 50 for um, a baseball player because they, again, they have to see a ball that's moving 100 miles an hour and they have you know less than half a second to react. So he doesn't want them to be at 2020, but 2015, 2010. But again, it depends on the level of athlete that you're working with. So there's a lot of factors to take in, into play. But Taylor, when I visited the Nike factory uh, years ago and looked at some of the data, early data on sports vision, the average acuity was 20 slash eight. Yep. But, so, yeah. So, you know, we think ah, 2020 is great for an athlete, just may not be enough for what they, their demands are. But also being careful not to sacrifice binocularity as well. Correct. Thank you. So um, this is a good thing for the doctors as well as the therapist to know about. Now, whether or not your practice has an optical um, is another story, but when athletes come in to see you and you know they are playing outdoors, you want to know what sunglasses they're wearing because tinted lenses can have a big impact on uh, contrast and contrast enhancement 
And this is just kind of a, a general overview of for what sports, what color lenses might be beneficial. I wanted to tell you guys about um, a product by Oakley. I'm not getting paid by them. If someone knows somebody for Oakley and they want to spend money, they can, but otherwise they're not. Um, I don't have a financial investment. Uh, Oakley has a really cool line called Prism, P-R-I-Z-M. And each lens that they have in the Prism lineup is designed specifically for a certain sport. So I'm going to show you our little demo here. I just want to make sure everybody can see that. So when an athlete comes in, I can show them a prism golf lens. I can show them a prism field lens or a trail lens. There's lenses for fishing, um, for driving, prism road. And you know, at first I thought it was just kind of a marketing tool, but I went to a um, optician presentation with Oakley. I'm a certified optician, so this stuff is really fascinating to me. Um, and they had a spectrometer there. And what they did was they put a lens on the spectrometer. You could see all the light waves just kind of go down across the board. Um, and when they put on a prism lens, you could see certain colors be enhanced. And uh, the lens is allowing more light waves of a certain color to still pass through the lens. And I think that's really important when it, when it comes to certain sports. The golf lens is super popular because the, the green is enhanced. And it, it's just another kind of tool to add to your toolbox, whether you sell these or not. It's something to be educated on and, and to know that there are options out there to help your athlete perform better. Because if you're a therapist, you know, it's not just your job to train ocular motor skills, binocularity. You want them to be better at their sport. So knowing some of these tinted lenses options, you don't have to be an expert, but just knowing that these are out there is, is a really cool tool to have. I might just comment too, we're getting an evaluation and we want to make sure we have plenty of time for training. We have about you know, 30 more minutes before questions, so. All right, I'll try to speed it up a little bit. So uh, our sports vision evaluation runs for about an hour and a half. Um, before the athlete even gets in to see me, I'm talking to my doctor that they had the binocular exam with, and I'm thinking about the demands of their specific sport. So whether they're a baseball player, football player, volleyball, tennis, I want to think outside the box a little bit and think, okay, what's really important here? Good peripheral awareness, you know, high level acuity, um, things like that. And, and that's going to kind of determine when I'm talking to them, what do I want to focus on for our whole plan? And then I'm also going to pay specific attention to certain tests that we do during the sports evaluation because some tests, in my opinion, might be a little bit more important than others. And I'm gonna look at how their body responds to certain tests. And then again, even before um, I start the sports evaluation, I'm gonna have a plan in my head based on the binocular exam, any areas that they were deficient, what their sport is, what I'm gonna do to improve uh, their sports performance. That way, following the sports evaluation, when we're having the consultation, I can pitch that and talk about that. So you really want to be prepared before they even come in for the sports vision evaluation on what you're going to do. So this is our sports vision evaluation questionnaire. This is your opportunity to get to know your athlete. You hopefully have an idea of, you know, whether it's the doctors or therapists doing this, why they're in to see you, but this gives you a little bit more of a kind of subjective information as to what's going on. And this is also your opportunity to create buy-in because if you know ahead of time that um, they're a baseball player and they're a center fielder and you say something like, oh, you know, that, that's the guy that kicks the field goals, you're probably not going to have much buy-in because you don't know anything about their sport. So you want to know about their sport and you want to kind of probe and ask the right questions of, you know, oh, if you're a baseball player, what type of pitches do you struggle with? What would you want to get better at? You know, when you're catching the ball, what do you do? How do you position yourself to catch the ball? So think about this opportunity to kind of create a personal connection, really get to know what their goals are, what they're struggling with. 
This is our sports vision evaluation form. So this is what I'm filling out when the patient comes to see me. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about these um, in particular, but I do wanna briefly mention, you know, the very first sports vision evaluation that I ever did, uh, I was using an older form, an older set of tests, and that was the only patient that I didn't get to do sports vision at our office. And that doesn't mean to say that what we had before wasn't good or wasn't beneficial, but it wasn't something that I worked on and really understood and could convey the importance to the parents. So every test that I have here is a combination of objective measurements and subjective measurements. I can convey to them why it's important, how we did it, what our norms are, and, and what I got out of it and how we're gonna improve those things. So it's really something that you wanna think about if you're gonna start doing sports vision evaluation specifically outside of a binocular exam. Create something that you understand. Use the tools that you have at your office to get a, um, a really clear picture of how they are gonna perform doing their sport. Uh, let's see here. So when I'm testing binocularity for the sports vision exam, I use the BTS-4. There's a great motor field test on there where we can test different, um, different gazes, up gaze, left gaze, right gaze. Um, we can look at their peripheral fusion. Do they pick up float? You know, looking at some basic depth perception. For ocular motor skills, I like to use our Synaptect. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Pursuits with a load. So I'll have, their, um, have them doing pursuits while they're balancing or in their ready stance. We also do a Visigraph on every patient. Talk a little bit about that. And then eye-hand body coordination. So again, specific sports gazes. So if I'm working with a volleyball player, I want them to be in up gaze. If I'm working with a baseball player, I want them to be in their hitting stance. I'm gonna check their localization on Brock string. We do the VO star. Fit lights are awesome. Uh, the fit lights I like to use as an observational tool for how they interact uh, balance wise and how they respond to something pretty challenging. And then we can also use the SBI as well. So some of the other doctors in the previous presentations talked a lot about Synaptec. I won't go too in depth into it. One of the things that's really cool about it though is that it provides objective data, meaning I can test these seven different visual skills. I can get a really nice printout and I actually give it to the athlete before they leave. So now they've got a hard copy from me of something that they did today that says, hey, these are all your visual skills. This is how you compare to uh, every other athlete that plays your sport, is your age, and plays the same position. So it's a really nice objective piece of data to give to them uh, that they can take with them and kind of reference back to. Um, I talked a little bit about the BTS-4, again, the motor field. Oh, uh, it also has a good diagnostic vergence range um, program on there. And in the book that comes with BTS-4, you can see what is uh, what are the standardized ranges, what they should be at. And, and that's also nice to have that I can say, hey, this was the score that they had in terms of eye teaming, bringing their eyes together up close, as well as far away. This is what I want their scores to be at. Talked a little bit about eye hand body assessments. Uh, the VO star I think is great. I can show that to the parent and they can have a nice visual representation of um, what's going on. And I, and I don't try to get too complicated. I just say, you know, this is a good representation of how their hands respond to what their eyes are telling them to do. And I actually have a, a series of other BO stars in my office that I can kind of show them as an example and say, this is where you were at. These are some other things to compare it to. That way they kind of know what the BO star means. Um, and I kind of went over all these. Here's a quick video. And this is our first video. I want you guys to pay attention to um, Jacob here. He's a, a college level baseball player. And to see what you notice.
Dr. H, did you want to add anything? Well, what I'll let Taylor explain, you know, what he's trying to do, but really watch him on the balance board. You know, he basically keeps the board fairly level, but look what happens to his body to keep it level, watch his hips. And so it's much, so it's not just about keeping that board level. Everybody tries, oh, it's level. But you know, if he shifts his hips to the left, the body goes to the right, and you see a lot of asymmet uh, symmetric movements here. So it's really good feedback for them to start understanding what's going on with their body in an attempt to keep balance. And if you'll notice, those targets weren't moving very quickly. They were pretty slow moving targets, and you could see how impacted his balance was by that. So this is what I actually give to the athletes or the parents. Um, I don't expect you to, I'm not going to go through all of this, but it talks about the 10 different skills that we looked at between the binocular exam and the sports vision evaluation. And then down at the bottom, I'm going to check off how I think they did. And notice we have adequate, opportunity, and inadequate. I'm not going to check off the inadequate boxes a lot. I don't want to... Um, I don't want to discourage an athlete, you know, especially the high level athletes who think they're good at everything. Um, and the word that we decided to use was opportunity because there's a lot of opportunity for growth for someone who has an adequate visual system. The high level athletes, I want them to improve even if they're adequate. So we have a nice series of definitions up at the top and then down at the bottom, I'm gonna check all that off. They're gonna take it with them and say, hey, these are all the areas that you know I can improve on. <clears throat> this is my little cheat sheet. Um, this is what I use when I'm filling out the form from the previous page to say, okay, how did they score on this in the binocular exam? How did they score on this in the sports exam? And I encourage, if you're going to start seeing sports patients, you don't have to come up with something this in depth, but something where you say, okay, this is how they did based on X, Y, or Z. And it, it's a real nice plan that we kind of put together so that when we're conveying again to the parents or athletes, you know, well, how did, how did I come to the conclusion that they were inadequate with this skill or that they need to improve? This shows me all the tests that I did to reach that conclusion. And it just, again, helps you create buy-in and creates a good understanding from everybody about what we did. Uh, kind of talked a little bit about this. You wanna know the comprehensive exam as well as the sports evaluation. You want a good combination, especially for athletes of quantitative objective data, as well as subjective data. When they have numbers, it's easier to understand. So giving them that synaptic printout is nice. A visograph, I'm gonna tell a really quick story um, about at first when Dr. H told me to do a visograph for sports evaluations. I was like, why is she telling me to do that? I know she just wants to frustrate me, but he didn't. Um, so I had a, um, an athlete who was a college baseball player. I think he was actually one in the first video. And he came to us because when he was catching a pop fly, he was a center fielder. Somehow it came out, of, I don't know if he told his coach or he told us, well, I am not sure which ball to catch, meaning he saw a double. So he was a severe CI, high exophoria, and I'm going over the visograph with him and his mom who was there um, talking about how, and his visograph was pretty poor, saying that you know a lot of times if we struggle with visual skills, it could affect X, Y, or Z, or you have to put a lot of energy into keeping your eyes working together and mom just started tearing up. And this is for the sports vision evaluation where I'm presenting the visograph. So, you know, I think it helped them to understand that vision has been something that he struggled with throughout most of his life and he's a college baseball player. So not just in college, but with school as well. So I think doing a visograph is a, is a real nice addition to a sports vision evaluation. Um, so how do we separate ourselves from other professionals? We want to identify ourselves as vision coaches and be experts in binocular vision. Um, you know, a lot of teams have the really cool fancy equipment and they can push the buttons and they can do, you know, reaction time or, um, 
you know, eye hand body coordination testing, but they don't understand um, binocularity and accommodation and vergence and things like that. So we really have to take that to the next level, next level of being able to train an athlete to have optimal binocularity. And, you know, you really want to be a good vision therapist before you dive into sports vision. And I think um, a, lot of, a lot of us get excited about sports vision, but you have to know the fundamentals of vision therapy because what you're doing in sports vision is vision therapy. You're just catering it to sports. So, so knowing how to do, you know, even the tools that aren't as fun or aren't as exciting, like uh, Vectogram or anaglyphs or knowing how to um, train ocular motor skills and pursuits and things like that, that's, a, that's all sports vision. So be, be able to know how to do all of that really well first, and then you can tie it into sports and relate it to your athlete. Um, one thing that I don't see a lot of people in sports vision talk too much about is knowing the athletes. Now, you don't want to overstep your boundary and, you know, teach a baseball player how to hit. But you want to know the ins and out of their sport because you have to create a connection and create buy-in. So, you know, you want to know what position they play. If they're, I'm working with a basketball player in high school, or I was, um, and he is a point guard. And, you know, the first day he came in, I was like, man, you're pretty tall for a point guard. So now he knows I know about basketball. He's a high school player. I want to know about the visual demands of what might be different for a point guard as opposed to a power forward. And that's not to teach them how to play their position or their sport better, but knowing what visual skills are needed for that sport. And like I said, you know, you don't want to overstep your boundaries. They have coaches, they have a lot of other professionals that are helping them, but knowing how to relate to them on their level, it's going to create buy-in and commit a little bit more. Um, also collaboration between the doctor, therapist, and maybe some of the other athletic coaches is really important. I've referenced back to that binocular exam a few times. If you're a therapist, you want to know, you know, are their prison bar ranges what they need to be? How's their NRA and PRA? Because that stuff is going to come up if you're doing the consult and you have to be able to understand some of those findings to help them in the therapy room. Dr. H, did you want to add anything on to that? Yeah, and this is especially true, you know, with patients with concussion and just your learning related as well. Many other fields, PTs and educators and trainers, you know, kind of inch in on doing some basic visual things and then call themselves visual coaches. And truly what differentiates us is the power of lenses, power of lenses and prisms and the visual processing and like Taylor said, the binocular accommodation. Because there's some very cool uh, apps out there to improve eye hand and tracking, whatever. But our difference is we're really getting to know that patient in the visual system and interrelated to all the other systems. And that's the point you want to make with your athletic coaches and trainers, that it's not just getting the app and practicing uh, video games. That there's, and that, some of that's helpful. I'm not denying it. But our real differentiation is really getting in there, knowing the visual skills, strengths, and helping them uh, enhance those types of skills. All right, so now we're going to get into sports vision training, my favorite part. About 15 minutes there, Taylor. What? Oh, man. All right. So uh, we want sports vision training to include all of these different skills. So cognitive awareness, timing, you have to be able to increase and decrease demand, obviously movement, uh, balance, central peripheral integration I'm going to talk a lot about. Different fields of gaze is huge. If you work with patients with uh, strabismus, you know, you know if they're non-competent, then you, you, you have to be able to work in those different fields of gaze for certain sports. And then visualization, being able to pre-plan what you're going to do before you go out on the field or the court. Some really high-level athletes talk about visualization. They don't really, you know, talk about it from the vision sense per se, but being able to rehearse what they're gonna do in their head is a, is a great skill to have. 
So this is something that uh, myself, uh, one of our associate doctors, Dr. Alex, put together. This is our general hierarchy of sports training. Oh, uh, the reason this PowerPoint is so beautiful is because of Dr. Alex. By the way, I just want to add that, that you guys all have something nice to look at because she, she made it look really good. Um, down at the bottom, our base is clarity. Um, this is really important for those particular sports that I was talking about where you have to be able to see the spin on the ball or you have to, you know, if you're a basketball player and you have to know what the defense is doing as you're running down the court uh, 30 yards away, 30 feet away. Um, if, if they aren't wearing their contacts correctly, you know, you're going to run into other issues if you're trying to train binocularity and clarity isn't what it could be. <clears throat> the next level is you have to relate the importance of what we're doing to the athlete. You know, vision is huge and they have to understand that. And the more you understand it and the more you can relate it to them, the more that you're going to get buy-in and commitment and they're going to do their activities, they're going to do their um, home training. So think about that as a foundation for what you do. If you have an athlete who comes in, even a kiddo, you know, and a lot of times we struggle with the tough patients who don't know why they're here and it's the same thing with sports. Um, the next level is all the skills that we're going to talk about, visualization, optimal binocularity, central peripheral is really big. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. When I talk about central skills, I like to think of central skills as your fixation, your saccades, your pursuits. That's your central. You're focusing centrally on the ball, but you have to have a good peripheral field and you have to be able to switch between, do I want to be more peripheral in this situation? Do I want to be more central? And, you know, when I say central peripheral, I'm talking about ambient focal, parvo magno, you know, all the different ways that we talk about it. I'm just going to refer to it as central peripheral. And then we want to load all three of these or even other skills together. We want to create high level activities where we're integrating all of these skills, especially for our high level athletes. Uh, the strobes, if you don't have them, you should get them. They're not that, I don't know how expensive they are, maybe a couple hundred dollars. Uh, but compared to some of the other pieces of equipment that you can get, the synaptic strobes are a great tool to have in your practice because you can work on, um, they basically flash and you can change how quickly they flash and it, it, it kind of simulates a distraction so the athlete can work through it. They really have to concentrate, they have to anticipate where the ball is going to be because the strobes interrupt that timing. It interrupts the information that they're getting. Um, I have a pair right here real quick. Oh, Google it, you'll be able to see how they work. Basically flash and, and block the information. Oh, here they are, they turned on. If you can see that, and then you can change which eye flashes, you can make it do all kinds of crazy things. Really cool tool. <clears throat> this page is our sports vision training warm-ups. So these are some really basic activities. Um, I believe you can get these on Dr. Hellerstein's website. Um, and this is something that we might give to a team. And you know, if they're not coming into the office, they're just some great kind of training warm-up activities where we cover ocular motor skills, we cover vergence. Um, number three, we work on peripheral focus or excuse me, peripheral charts with soft focus. Um, we use McDonald cards that you can get through Burnell or you can create your own. And then some accommodative work, number four, near far jumps. So, you know, if you have the opportunity to go and talk with a team or you've got to go through things kind of quickly, these might be some activities to just kind of get your foot in the door and say, hey, this is what we do. These are some ways you can help your athletes visually get warmed up or to demonstrate some vision therapy activities. All right, so I talked a little bit about central peripheral integration and it's, it's one of my favorite things to train in sports because almost every ball sport, yes, you're centrally focused and fixated on the ball, but you also have to know where the other players are. You have to know where your body is in space. You have to know where the out of bounds is. So anytime I have the opportunity with an athlete to work on uh, a central skill such as a saccade and incorporate peripheral movement, peripheral information, 
we got to do that. So I have a couple of videos here that I'm going to show you. These are some low tech videos if you guys don't have the fancy equipment. Um, so I'll play these and talk a little bit about them afterwards. So I think you get the idea. So our patient is reading a Kirshner arrow chart. She's tossing the ball in the direction that the arrow is telling her to. So she's keeping fixated centrally, but she's peripherally catching and tossing the ball. And then she's also stating it out loud. Uh, over here is Joey. He's gonna be in a lot of our videos. He's a baseball player that um, has worked with me for a little while. And this is the space fixator. You got to have a space fixator. It's one of the simplest but most efficient um, peripheral awareness activities that we're that we're going to demonstrate. Back, ready, touch, back, ready, touch, back, ready, touch, look, back. So I do it a little bit differently for the space fixator. Um, I like to have them say, "Ready, touch, look, back." You can do it both ways, ready, look, touch back. Um, email me if you want some more information. Um, and then it's a great tool, a great activity to load. You can add the metronome to it. You can put a heart chart in the middle of it. So instead of saying ready, touch, look back, the athlete will read the letters. So A, X, Y, Z. Great central peripheral activity. You can add the feet into it. You can have them switch hands. So it's a really great tool to load. You can move those dots further and further out. They can do it at home. Um, learn the space fixator. If you want to do sports vision, there's a lot of ways to modify it. <laughs> All right, so um, this is my good friend, Martin. He came to us because he had a, a pretty significant vertical deviation. He's a former semi-pro soccer player from Europe, and he hasn't played soccer in a while. When he looked up, he saw a double. We got that under control, and he wanted to start getting back into soccer. So this activity that I'm going to show you is really high level. There's a lot of things going on here. I'm going to show you this because I think it's easier to break down a high level activity to maybe be where the athlete is um, than to kind of piece it all together and, and load it up. There you go. Good morning. So Martin is following a Marsden ball. That's his central task. I'm giving him two peripheral tasks of catching the basketball and hitting the fit lights with his feet. So a cool thing about the fit lights, some of the other docs have talked about the fit lights, is you can take them off the wall and you can move them around. So for a soccer player, I'm going to put them in down gaze. So a really high level activity. Um, I remember him coming back to talk to me and saying that, you know, the peripheral awareness component of sports vision training was huge for him. He was talking about seeing the field differently and things opening up, which was, which was really cool. Um, I want enhanced binocularity. And this video, I'm going to show you a great um, depth perception tool that we used on the VTS4, but you can use the vectograms, you can use anaglyphs. I'll just run this. That is a tennis player that I worked with, um, high level tennis player. She's in seventh grade playing high schoolers, uh, came to us because she had reduced stereopsis, reduced depth perception, something wasn't right. Regardless with this activity, she's using a stick. And as that circle, that target is coming closer to her, she's localizing it all the way into her.
and localizing it all the way out. If you notice those circles were pulling apart pretty slowly, as she was improving, I was increasing that speed. I don't know if this is a technical term, but I call it speed of virgins. So how quickly can she localize and maintain that virgins as it's coming forth there? Can she converge properly and keep that stick localized where it's supposed to be? So again, think about getting your athletes move, moving at a, um, further away and can they maintain uh, proper virgins in space, especially at a distance? We're probably gonna go 715, I'm sorry, Dr. H. Hope that's okay. <laughs> but I'll stay to answer questions at the end. I want to add that. All right. So this is my baseball player. We're using the fit lights here. And pay attention to what is specific to baseball. He is a shortstop. Good. Quick, quick, quick. There you go. <gasps> All right, so right there, I was having him using his catching hand, only his left hand. And if you notice how I had the fit light spaced out, it might be simulating what a ball is going to do. Um, if he's a shortstop, the, the hits that he's going to catch are going to be a little bit lower to the ground. So I don't have him all up high. He's going to be catching uh, or fielding grounders. So eye hand body coordination, working on reaction time. Fit lights are a great tool to be able to customize, move around, do different things with different athletes. So this is a volleyball player that we had into our office. We are uh, making this activity procedure really specific to volleyball. As you can see, I have the fit lights placed up higher now, and I'm going to show you two different videos, one after the other. The second is after she practiced and we worked on this for a little while. Good, toss it up a little bit higher. Okay. There you go. Good. <laughs> All right, so that's our first video. Second one. improvement in the second video. Um, you know, I, I think that that just is a good demonstration of how much she practiced and how hard she was working. Um, she was more confident. And again, central target is the ball. And then I've got the lights as a peripheral stimulus. All right, I've got three sets of videos um, or three more videos here. They're all a different combination of central peripheral integration, speed of processing. I'm just gonna play all three and then I'll talk a little bit about each one. Four, M, B, That's not right, that, I don't know what that is. He's already gotten that high. 11,000, which got me in the process is about what everybody gets. If you'll notice, um, for those second two videos with Martin, the peripheral stimulus was in down gaze. He is a soccer player. Now, obviously, the ball is going to be up in the air sometimes, but usually it's going to be um, below the waist. And then also what I did on the Santa Vision integrator, I have a white background with white, or excuse me, a green background with white targets. 
and that is to simulate being on the soccer field. So um, these are things to think about. How can you load the activity? How can you make it relatable to the sport? And the second video right here, this tool is called the Optics Trainer. It's a really, really cool piece of equipment. Uh, it's not something you would really think about traditionally with sports vision training, but this camera system down at the bottom here um, calibrates to Martin's eyes. Wherever he looks, it blows up those asteroids. So he cannot look away from this screen. If he does, he's not gonna hit the asteroids. So that's how I know I have a really good central peripheral integration activity. All right, so this is a couple baseball specific activities. Uh, I just came up with these using a Marsden ball. These two activities are really to bring awareness to a baseball player. And again, you can kind of relate these to another sport of what are your eyes doing? Where are you actually looking when you hit the ball? So the first video, um, I just call that the contact drill. So the objective isn't to hit the ball hard. It's to watch where the bat makes contact with the ball. This is for those players that like to knock it out of the park but are consistent with it. The second one, we're working on timing. Again, I don't want Joey to hit it hard. I sometimes will add a metronome to that task. So they're hitting the ball on the metronome. So we're building a really um, good timing ability to hit the ball carefully and then I'm going to load it and have him hit it a little bit harder or I might have him go into a little bit more of a full swing but those are just a couple good baseball activities and these are I'm going to talk to these because I'm running out of time oh, wait, that's uh, on the left you is Anna, my tennis player so as you notice yes yeah, she's hitting the okay. pin lights but look at how I have him position that's something okay, I'll take usually this. where a tennis right. ball is going to come and then I'm having her swing as if she's holding her racket. Um, really simple activity, but it's not just moving your arms, but she's now in the motion of swinging. This is an example of Joey using the strobes. He is positioned to be in a hitting stance. <laughs> Right now, those strobe lights are flashing, making it harder to catch the ball. Yeah, I'm standing behind him to make it a little bit uh, more challenging to predict where the ball is going to go. And I can change the strobes that he's using and make it more challenging. I can throw the ball harder. Dr. H, you want to talk about yoke prism really quick? Well, just that uh, it's a great tool to have, uh, whether it's a walking rail or balance beam or any of those activities you put on yoke prisms. So the one thing we can do is really change how the world looks and then see how fast this athlete can process and respond to it. Great athletes, you can put, have them come in their gear, you can throw balls at them, put on the yoke prisms. And great athletes, one or two practice, and I don't care if it's 10, 15, what direction, they usually have adjusted very, very quickly. Yep. Uh, another good diagnostic tool as well, if you want to add that to your sports evaluation. So, you know, I didn't go too much into visualization, but uh, obviously this is Dr. Hellerstein's area, but the, the benefit of teaching an athlete to be able to run through what they're going to do in their head is invaluable. They're getting what they call mental reps. Or if you have a quarterback or a point guard that has to run plays, can they see and know where everyone else is going to be on the field? Can they visualize what's going to happen when the wide receiver does, you know, this route? Or when, when uh, for a basketball player, you know, what their other uh, teammates are going to do? That's a huge, huge component. And we will work on that a little bit. Do you want to add anything, Dr. Rich? Yeah, I actually work on it a lot of bit. <laughs> it's my area. Yeah, I've of heard love, about that. And, uh, it is so powerful. And if you want more information on my website, lynnhellerstein.com, 
slash resources. Uh, there are some activities. It's also in my books, uh, especially 50 Tips to Improve Your Sports Performance, on step-by-step -step on how to help from little kids to major league athletes improve their imagery. Most of our athletes are great visualizers. The problem is if you visualize it wrong, it's very powerful. You keep going over, falling off the beam, falling off the beam, falling off the beam. What do you think is going to happen? You fall off the beam. So it's how to really be in charge of your own imagery and thoughts. And so that, uh, you know, I had three lectures on that um, at this conference on the first couple of days. So you can look that up if you want to know more about visualization. Um, talked a little bit about visualization. So um, on the left is Dr. Hellerstein's granddaughter. And this, is, this video is demonstrating that everyone is an athlete matter how young, matter how old. And these were at, what did you say? Like a- um, Like something monkey gym, uh, <laughs> a kid's gym. Kid's gym. You know, it's fit lights at age four and five. Yep, so like Dr. Hellerstein said, these are fit lights like I was using with the high level athletes. Um, and they found out a way to make it fun for younger kids. Uh, this next video is one of my favorites. Can, have you been able to hear the volume, Dr. H? The sound? Um, you know, when you're talking, I can't, but the volume has been okay. I don't know if you'll be able to hear them or not. From the video, though, have you been able to hear it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, please turn up your sound. This is one of my favorite videos that we have. A, D, M, T. J R E Oh, oh, it almost hit me in the penis. <laughs> so that, that's one of our our youngest athletes who um, really motivated by just having a basketball in there. And he loved basketball. He would try to dribble around the office, but his hands weren't moving how he wanted them to. But added a basketball on a letter chart. And of course, some good commentary as well. So you want your procedures to include some or all of these because sports is a combination of um, balance, movement, different fields of gaze, timing, all of that stuff. Especially for the high level athletes, they're doing all of this um, at a much faster pace. So think about how you can load and unload uh, different activities. Some of the benefits of sports vision training, the ball looks bigger, things are moving slower, I have more time to react. I think confidence is improving is huge, just like with our reading and learning kiddos. You know, we're working at a level to give them something achievable. If, if a kid came into your office and couldn't catch a ball and he left being able to catch a ball, they're gonna try new things. You have to be able to work at that optimal level of it's not too easy that they get bored it's not challenging that they get discouraged a lot of doctors talk about this in different areas um, joey his mom sent me that uh her, his parents were great incredibly uh, motivated, committed, and it's just cool that, you know, they're kind of keeping me up to date on how, how he was doing. So you got stories like that. I don't think we'll have time for Laura's success story. She was a mountain biker who sports vision changed her life. I would not have anticipated mountain biking being a, a sport that we would be able to help somebody with, but we did. You can email me and I can tell you the story. Uh, Dr. H., yeah, real quick. I mean, at what age is this effective? This is Reynold, who's like a 74-year-old, I believe, uh, triathlete, who had to stop comp competing because he had diplopia when he'd get out of his swim, and he couldn't jump on his bike. It was an inter he showed intermittent esotropia. At his age, he took our vision therapy right into his training. I don't know how many hours a day he practiced. Within 10 weeks, he was fused, he was straight, he was back competing. And he'd always place. He said, at his age, if he finishes the the activity, he will always place because there's not very many competitors at his age. But just shows you how effective 
no matter how old you are, if the motivation is there. Okay. And uh, this is again an older guy who used to play baseball, was going to a fantasy camp, couldn't find the ball, couldn't catch the ball. His kids had vision therapy, as, uh, they were, had learning problems, and he put himself in a short term program so he could really get back into watching the ball. And he wrote us and he said he had the time of his life and he could really play the ball even when he was like 62 years old. So the perfect formula, we want good athletic skills. That's not really our domain, but you know, if you have a, a, a patient or an athlete and, and they've got you know, good physical traits and, and they're driven and motivated, once they get those superior vision, superior vision skills, that's really gonna unlock a lot of doors for them. You can think of vision as a cap. You know, you could be the absolute best athlete and the most gifted, but if vision isn't where it needs to be, they're going to be limited. These are uh, a few resources that we have. Um, Dr. Hellerstein's book over on the right is really short and sweet, and it's nice to kind of read and even give to teams and coaches because, it, you know, it's not uh, something that they have to dive into. They can just kind of look at it over on the sidelines. And then I wanted to add this slide in. For those of you who like the research, uh, email me. I can send you a PDF uh, copy or you can just screenshot this. The University of Cincinnati did some really great kind of landmark vision uh, training studies. I have a few on concussion incidents. I have another one on strobe training. Um, I think there's a couple on hockey as well. So there is some really cool research out there and these are all recent too. So 2015, 2017. So let me know if you can't find these, um, just send me an email and I can send them to you. Cool, so thank you all so much. Uh, that was awesome being able to be here and share information with everyone. Um, you have myself, Dr. Hellerstein's email right here. If you have any questions or, you know, I, I know we kind of felt a little rushed at the end going through the therapy, the, the training activities, but um, this is something that I'm really passionate about uh, talking about and sharing. So please reach out to me. Dr. H. Well, first of all, thank you, Taylor. You did fabulous. And I'm very blessed to have vision therapists of quality like you. And so uh, it's very fun to work with you. And we're open to questions. So please, uh, should we have them unmute? I've been staying pretty up to date on most of the chat. Do you want to update? Did uh, you uh, answer some of those that posted? Did you chat to them privately? I did. OK. Um, did anybody else, there was a question about the prism box. If anybody else was wondering where they get that, did you want to share that maybe widely to the group? Yeah, Taylor, you want to, um, that prism uh, box that you showed? Yeah, I don't know. Um, we have a really good Oakley rep who comes in probably once or, you know, once every couple months. So reach out to Oakley. Um, they have really good reps and, uh, and I'm sure, I think we just asked him for one and he gave us one. You, you know, if you carry the Oakley line, you, you shouldn't have to pay for it. So um, your Oakley rep should be able to help you out with that. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions they'd like to pose? I want to thank everybody for all their inspiring and uh, wonderful comments. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and there yeah, was one I didn't catch at the very beginning. And there's a question, uh, would you ever administer a test at the beginning to purposely retest it? So you know, I think we do this, uh, uh, the docs, when they're doing their binocular exam, we'll retest NPC at the end, or they'll do it five times. So I think that's, that's a great thing. You know, if, you're, if you suspect something or you suspect um, fatigue, definitely retest it. I know you might not have as much time, so you kind of have to cater that exam depending on how much time you have. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you both again for donating your time and sharing your expertise with us, inviting us into your space. Thank everybody for joining us and stay tuned. We have another great week next week. And the exciting news is that we're going to be extending beyond into May and June. So watch for that email. 
We already have over 40 speakers and sessions programmed for May. So the fun continues. All right, have a great day and a great night, everyone. Thank yep. you all. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe.